Okay, so we are testing audio. We will be starting soon. Can we hear any audio there? Okay, I can hear it on the stage as well. Yeah. That's good. Eugene, do you hear me in the headphones? Someone needs to, can you hear it here? Because see, this is the delay. You don't. Yo, yo, yo. Yo. Okay, can you hear yourself? Okay, you should hear me now. Eugene, tell me if you will hear me in the stream. Okay?
Boom. Hello, everyone. So, good evening. We are here today, uh, Pilot is Munich and Pi Munich. Actually, it's been one year since we did this meetup, and we're going to do it again. <laughs> and I'm here with Anto my name is Laisa Shoa, and I'm here with Anton Caceres, who will tell all the things that we have planned for tonight. Oh, thank you. Today is a special one. Today is a big one. In fact, the biggest one that we had. We have three talks, which is intense. I'm so sorry to put stress on speakers, but that's the format. So we have three full talks, and then we have three more lightning talks. So we're also streaming this, so we need to kind of keep up to the schedule, right? So we people will be watching online right now, hopefully. Say hi if you're watching us online. And we need to be yeah, precise on our timing, so that's why... Don't be offended. Please take seats. Not just us, it's also our online audience. We have three full talks, three lightning talks. We will make also a raffle of two Python books. We will have some interactive session in between, so stay tuned. And uh, yeah, without much introductions, let's just go to the first talk. Or... So, first speaker and our host of today is Rafael Bravissimo. <laughs> Okay, I can hear myself, so this thing is working. Um, I would need someone to put my slide up the, up the front. Yes, perfect. Um, Anton has told me that, oh, yeah, we have a lot of talks today, and we have to be in time and actually prepare 26 slides for 15 minutes of presentation. And you know that it's one minute per slide, so this is not going to work out. But I'm just going to shave a part of the NetLight presentation. So first of all, Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you like the office. It's new because we moved here like two months ago or so. Maybe you attended the meetup in the, like almost one year ago, actually, in the old office. Um, this one is a little bit bigger and a, a lot nicely decorated. So you can sit around here. I hope you're all comfy. Drinks are in the back. If you need more pizza, I don't know if there's any left, but you know, just, just feel comfy if you need anything. Feel free to approach me or other net lighters afterwards. I think we're not wearing stickers or anything. But you know, just feel free to approach me. Um, just net light at a quick, quick glance. We actually are a Swedish tech consultancy coming from Stockholm, where is the, our biggest office is there um, with a thousand net lighters here at Munich. We're only like almost 500, a little bit under 500. But apart from that, in the DEC region, we're like at 11 locations and we've been around for 24 years. And what we do is mostly software engineering, IT management. You can read the whole rest. Um, down there, there. We also have partnerships with many bigger um, companies like AWS and Microsoft and GCP and the World Food Program. But I would say let's let's kick it off with the presentation. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about Python three metaprogramming. The three was not in the title before, but I just figured just in case, like Python two is end of life, but you know just in case because actually something changed there. Um, but first of all, who am I? Um, my name is Raphael. Just call me Rafa. That's why it's in bold. Um, I'm a consultant at NetLight for three and a little bit years now. And I would consider myself a back-end generalist with a focus on software engineering. And in my free time, I love playing board games and dancing some salsa. Um, and the topic today is metaprogramming. And basically, what this means is more or less a little bit like programs that manipulate or, or change the way that other programs I got louder, I think, um, work. Um, but you might know it, for example, from the Kotlin uh, Gradle DSL, if you're a Java coder, um, but also like from parsers, interpreters, compilers, or other things. Now, meta obviously is not unique to programming. Um, there's like maybe you had some model driven development at university, you have like meta models, so models of models, or there's also meta humor. So I found this funny thing on the internet. So some genius. Um, put the sign up and said like no thumbtacks in wall and fasten the sign with thumbtacks into the wall right and then some other smart person put a uh, sticky note that points to the thumbtacks like what right and then there's like no sticky notes on signs by putting a sticky note on the sign and this just continues right no sticky notes on sticky notes with a sticky note on the sticky note and no purple sticky notes with a purple sticky note right so you see it's kind of like self-referential and kind of like loopy and stuff and in python um, the good thing is that everything is an object, so that cuts out some of the work for us already. So you can, for example, get the type of the number five, and 
well, this would not be a thing that I can see or something. In, in Python, you get, oh, yeah, this is, this is the type of five is a class. It's, it's the int class. And if you get the type of print, I can just throw some functions around, right? And this will say it's a built-in function or method. And it is a class. The type of print is a class. And I can even get the type of none. And it's a none type. And I can also, as I already said, pass functions around. I can throw print around. And I can print print. Um, and that's nice, of course, because that allows us to do cool things like decorators. And decorators are the first principle but of metaprogramming that I'm going to talk very shortly about, but very, very shortly, because the actual thing that I want to introduce is meta classes. Um, so decorators wrap functions modifying their behavior. And you might know them from add property, class method, static method, or down here. This is an example from Fast API where you just decorate a function. And if a HTTP GET request arrives, then it gets redirected to this function and it gets executed. And you return a dictionary, but actually some magic happens and it actually gets turned into a string, into a JSON string, right? So all of this is done by this magic decorator. Now, if you're not familiar with decorators, it might be a little bit of a struggle going forward, but let's, let's try. The concept today is meta classes, and you, you are familiar with classes, right? So a class instantiates and defines the behavior of an instance of this class. And now we're introducing meta classes, so classes of classes. And what meta classes do is they instantiate and define the behavior of a class, right? And this sounds a little bit weird at first, like how is this supposed to look, right? So let's play around a little. We have this class definition here, this class A. But it's just empty, it doesn't do anything. We can create an instance of A, and then we can get the type of the instance, right? And it will say, this is a instance of A. Simple until here. And we can check that instance is not a class, right? With a handy inspect module that you can import. It's a built-in. And it will say false, because A is not a, this A instance is not a class. It's obviously a class instance. We can also check if A is a class, and it will say true. And you can check that the type of A instance, which is A, is a class, which is the same as this line, right? So it's also true. And now I have a question for you. Um, what is the type of A? Ah, but that would be tricky to declare, right? You, you would have to write something like class, class, and that's strange. But it's a good guess. That's, that's a good guess. The solution is that the, the type of A is type. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And we can check that A is an instance of type. And that also doesn't make a lot of sense, right? We're using type the whole time to, to query information about our object. And, and just to check that it's actually the same thing, we can get the type of A and check that this is the type that we're using to query this. And it says true, right? And if we get the type of the type of A, so the type of type, it's also type. Like, uh, I, I struggled when I was studying up on this, so I can imagine that some of you are confused too. Um, and, the, and the solution is that type is actually built in meta class. Um, so we can just call type, and it will warn us. It will give us an error, actually. And, and it says type takes one or three arguments. The type that we've been using is this built-in, which is like it returns us information about our type that we're looking for. But if we call type with three parameters, actually, it creates a new class. And the three parameters in this case are the name, the list of base classes, so what are we inheriting from, and a dictionary with a namespace, so class variables and methods. Right, so this is straight from the Python documentation. I'll, I'll explain it. Once the class namespace has been populated by executing the class body, the class object is created by calling meta class. And this is a little bit like what, what this talk is about, right? So when we are declaring a class, what is actually happening is that the interpreter is instantiating a meta class for us. So our class is actually the instance of a higher class. And the hint here is that the meta class that is referred to here, by default, is always type, which means that Actually, we're always, if we don't do any weird stuff like we're going to do later, we're always implicitly calling type. And that means that we can actually have this piece of code, which is like very normal, right? We have a parent class that doesn't do anything. We have some class that inherits from parent class. And with some var class variable and a function, we can rewrite this entirely just using type calls to this thing. Um, and 
you can see that there's some parallels, right? So we say that there's something there, an object that is parent class, and we call type passing the name, the basis, and the attributes. In this case, parent class doesn't inherit from anything and has no, no class fields or anything. So that's the, the definition. With some class, it's a little bit trickier. We have to extract this function first. And self in this context doesn't really make sense, but self is just a parameter, it's just a name, so it doesn't really matter. And then we can essentially in the same way, just that in this case, parent class is the parent class of some class, and we pass in a dictionary, the namespace that we have instantiated, that we have um, prepared into the dictionary, into the attributes of type. I don't know if, if I lost someone, but it, someone is saying, cool, cool, that, that's cool, that's cool. I'll, I'll just continue. Now, when objects are instantiated, actually behind the hood, two things happen. There's two calls in the parent class of the thing that we're instantiating. Um, so if you're creating an instance, it's in the class. There's a call to new and there's a call to init. And maybe, or, I mean, you have to be familiar with init, but maybe you're not with new. So if, if you've ever wondered, like, why, if you play around with type hints, why does init never return anything, right? It always, when you type annotate the thing, it returns none, and that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because it's a constructor. Um, but the thing is that new is actually the, the function that returns the class instance, passes that via self to init, and then init initializes it. It just sets some, per some, some values on the, on the fields. And new usually looks like this, right? It, it takes um, the class of which an instance was requested as a first argument, and the remaining argument is just what you would pass to the class anyways. And the return value should be the new object instance. Now, th this all maybe feels a little bit disjointed, but we're going to put it together in a second. So what actually happens when the interpreter reads something like class A dot, 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 is that it implicitly, as we saw before, calls this, the meta class. And this is an object instantiation. We're instantiating something because classes are also objects too. Everything in Python is an object. So since this is an object instantiation, it implicitly calls the new function on the meta class and the init function on the meta class. And this looks familiar too, right? It's our name, basis, and attributes. To instantiate this class, not the class instance, it's kind of the meta class instantiates the class and the class instantiates the class instance. So let's write our own meta classes. <laughs> so much preparation and now we can actually do some coding, right? So the use case, please don't judge me for this. It's for didactic purposes. It's stupid, I know, because there's no such thing as private fields in Python and stuff like this, but it's, it's, it's an example. So what we want to do is imagine I write this class model and for every unders with a single underscore prefixed class variable, I want to auto generate a getter for it with magic, right? Or meta classes. Um, and it will print it out in a fancy way. So, how would we go about this? So, the first thing is that we have to say you might think we can maybe just override the, the new and init functions of type, right? Because implicitly everything is type. But that is not allowed. Um, you can try that, you'll get an error. So the trick is actually we're going to hook in between. So we're going to create an, our own meta class, which is just a class, right? And we're going to tell model that, that please use this meta class, that is our meta class, to instantiate this class. Um, and the way this, <coughs> sorry, the way this works is that we have to tell the interpreter that model meta class is a meta class. And we do that by saying it inherits from type because if it's a type and type is a meta class, model meta class is a meta class. Um, how do we continue? Now, we, we saw before that new creates and returns a class instance. So in our case, the instance of our meta class is our model class, right? So this function is gonna be called when the interpreter reads this class definition. And what we do is we, we just write down what we learned before, right? And what we need to do, because new returns a class instance, is we need to instantiate the class here via this type new. And we, in this case, we're just passing things along, right? In this case, nothing would be changed. This is the default implementation. And now just a little bunch of code appeared, but this is not spectacular from this point on, because actually this password thing is passed into the attributes, right? It's part of the dictionary. So you can use all of these fields, parameters, for anything you would like. You can iterate over them, you can change them, you can change the name of the class, you can change, you can delete all attributes, you can do whatever you want to. And in this case, I'm just creating a dictionary, 
I'm iterating over the attributes. I'm filtering some built-in names with the double with the dunder thingy. And if one starts with an underscore, I create, I add this 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 name with the get. There's an underscore in here, remember? Um, and the name of the of the field. And then I just add this one liner lambda because it's shorter and instead of declaring an internal function. And I wrap this in a nice F string. And then when I actually instantiate my model down here and I get the password, this function magically exists, right? And the only thing that I had to do or that your consumer, your user had to do was say this meta class um, of this model is this model meta class. Cool. Now, why would I do this? Um, <laughs> the cool thing is that you could say, and you would be right, you can do this with in many other ways, right? You have class decorators, you have other things. Um, the cool thing about this is that inheritance preserves meta classes. So in this case, we have a meta class here. We can tell because it inherits directly from type. It has an overloaded new. Um, and there's an intermediate class that we define as it, it, the meta class of this intermediate class is this meta. And then we have a final class, which parent class is intermediate. And without writing any other code, when the interpreter runs through this, it is instantiating these classes, right? Using the meta class. So automatically what gets printed because of this line here is intermediate. Remember the name of this class gets passed in here, gets printed here, intermediate in meta class new. And then when the interpreter runs over this line here, the final one, the same thing happens, final gets passed in here, and the th same thing is printed. Coolio. Now, should I even use meta classes now that we have this piece of information? As I said before, there's other ways of doing things which are more simple. So this is a quote by Tim Peters, the author of the Sen of Python, and he says, meta classes are deeper magic than 99% of users should ever worry about. If you wonder whether you need them, you don't. So you probably don't need them if you didn't need them until now. But it's it's good to know, right? It's it's good to understand how Python works. Um, so the people who actually need to know um, need them know with certainty that they need them and don't need an explanation about why. Right. And that's my talk. Um, thanks a lot. There's some takeaways here summarized. Uh, meta classes instantiate and define the behavior of classes. Type is the built-in default meta class. Um, meta class. This thingy gets implicitly called when declaring classes. New creates a class instance or meta class instance, and it initializes it. And there's probably a way to solve your problem that does not involve meta classes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bravissimo! Bravo! Good job. I did it in the 15 minutes. Right? You did. You did perfect timing, yeah. and big thanks for that. So let's switch the uh, the equipment. Uh, yeah, we have to sacrifice Q&A to be on schedule this time. We will do ad hoc Q&A. That's when you have a beer, catch Rafael and tell him the truth about meta classes, why you should use them or not. And yeah, meanwhile, we are setting up our next talk right away. Great, we already have slides here. You can disconnect it. Now this, you can already take it. Okay, it seems like I still have a few seconds to fill in. So we have here, also a spatial meter because we have guests from everywhere. Uh, raise your hand who is not from Munich. Okay, told you. So I don't know about our attendees, but we have some Lightning Talk speakers that come all the way from London, Vlad there. And we have our team coming all the way from Ukraine. Raise your hands or stand up actually. You deserve an applause, I think. <laughs> Big applause for coming just to visit us today. So believe me, sacrificing the Q&A is worth it. We need, we need everybody to speak today. So are we ready here? OK. Hi. So then Kate, a wonderful pie lady, will tell us about the intellectual yeah. property. Please make some warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> sure. okay. So I'm very glad to see so many people who are interested in intellectual property rights. Normally, this is a very dry topic, and I'll try somehow to break the ice today and to introduce you to a topic which is also very, very important for data scientists, since uh, the topic of big data is um, becoming bigger and bigger, and we have to deal with a lot of uh, copyrights and also database um, intellectual property rights. So I'll start with a little introduction on who I am. 
So currently, um, I'm assuming the position as a patent engineer in a company dealing with uh, innovation technologies. And I'm responsible for patenting different inventions, mainly in the field of electromobility. And uh, my special field of specialization in IP rights is patents. So uh, patents are mainly granted for uh, technical inventions. So um, I help our inventors actually to uh, patent their ideas, starting from the uh, drafting of patent applications, also conducting patent searches, and evaluating competitors' patents, monitoring competitors' patents, so that we can detect white spots with which we can fill with our own inventions. Um, what actually are intellectual property rights? Um, why they are so important in, in the today's world? Um, those are intangibles um, which can guarantee a specific marketplace of companies, especially when we speak about startups and um, medium and small and medium um, enterprises. Intellectual property rights, they can guarantee you um, exclusivity um, when, you, when you want to launch, uh, launch sorry, a specific product or service on the market. And um, they will give you also the possibility to uh, protect your ideas and uh, promote, of course, the dissipation of technological knowledge. So uh, you can see that we have a great variety of intellectual property rights. Um, today, we wouldn't have the time to go through the whole uh, set of um, inter IP rights. I will just um, concentrate on the three main, copy uh, on the three main uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, those are the copyrights, patents, and database um, rights, which um, have relevance uh, to the realm of um, uh, data science. Um, <clears throat> as you know, copyrights are very important once we create a software. Um, behind the software, there is a, always a copyright which will guarantee um, that this um, intellectual property will be protected normally for 50 up to 100 years um, after the creator dies. You have this um, certainly uh, protected. Copyrights normally protect the creative expression of an idea, but not the idea itself. Um, patents, as we have already mentioned, um, those um, intellectual property rights, which are mainly granted for technical inventions. Um, however, recently there are many um, uh, there, there are many changes in introduction of um, possibilities for patenting also software uh, inventions under specific uh, circumstances, um, especially when we have a technical application and when we can create a technical effect out of a software on a hardware application and database rights um, those are very interesting uh, ip rights that um, emerged at the beginning of the 1990s um, due to the fact that many people who um, wanted to protect their data they invested a lot of money in compiling this data and um, normally the database um, rights they are protected for example in germany under the copyright act for example and um, they are typical for Europe and the European jurisdictions. Uh, once you get out of U uh, Europe, it's getting a little bit more difficult and depends on the country. <clears throat> so as, as we know, big data um, is structured, semi-structured or unstructured information and it's coming, um, it's in big volumes. Uh, the velocity of generating this data is also increasing over time and we will have to deal with this data in a proper way so that we can extract some meaning out of it. Um, data scientists uh, use many diff different softwares to deal with this data, and um, they didn't write um, uh, the software. They Normally, they do not write it. They just take it, maybe develop it, or develop different um, um, derivatives of the software using for free um, the data. Uh, online, so this is called open source. And the open source is normally void of copyrights, which means you can use the data for free. Um, programming languages like Python, uh, one um, very good example of, um, of a way to use the open source data. So um, I'm coming to open source licensing because um, <clears throat> um, it, it actually consists of uh, intellectual property rights um, which are being transferred from one, for example, software to another, although you have the term open source. Um, as we said, every piece of software is copyright protected. Um, however, some of the owners of this software can um, 
let's say, um, um, give the, the software for free, so you don't have to pay anything and use it just for free and uh, for to develop it. Um, so um, the open source licensing, that's why it's becoming very, very common nowadays. And now I want to um, bring your attention to three ops, uh, types of open source licensing. And the first one is public domain licensing. Um, you, you know that it consists of all creative work, which is given to the common public, so um, it's for free. Um, and, and afterwards, we come to the permissive licensing. Um, this is a very, very special way of um, licenses, um, which is used to attribute to the original authors um, um, the copyrights that um, that they. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, it isn't funny. So um, permissive licenses um, uh, allow you to free use um, a software. You have the right to redistribute it. However, you need to copy uh, the copyright text inside the new version of the software, which means if I take a software and I further develop it, I have to, to make sure that um, the copyrights are inside of it, the, of the original software. So it's a way of passing uh, the copyrights um, to the newer version of softwares or the derivatives of the, of the software so that um, these copyrights um, are actually um, attri are attributed to the original owner of the software on which you base your further developments. So um, the last type of uh, licenses, uh, which, uh, which I was, yeah, uh, complement on, um, this is the copyleft licenses, those um, something like permissive licenses, however, they are um, a little bit more stringent, which means uh, once I take a software here, not only I need to copy the original copyright text into the new software or derivative of software, but I also need to assure that uh, the new version of the software complies with that what's written inside a copyright license, which means um, if I take the code, it's the derivative of the code or the alternation of the code, the new code uh, should comply with the original uh, intellectual property rights. Um, so, or I have written, uh, if you modify the code, it has to be exactly as open as the original one. So, um, <clears throat> Here, I just took some statistics, uh, how often permissive licenses will be used. Um, most, in most of the uh, cases, we have between 65 and 75% of the open software, uh, softwares um, that use permissive licenses. This means you copy and paste the copyright text and licenses inside your know, new version of software. And that's why how you guarantee uh, that the original owner uh, is being attributed um, the, the needed respect for his intellectual property work. So um, <clears throat> now I'm coming slowly to the topic of software patenting. Um, uh, copyright only protects, as we said, um, the literal expression of a computer program, not the idea behind. So many companies are just trying to also protect the idea behind and opposite to the open source, of course. They want to get um, patents on this. However, the European Patent Convention is organized around um, the exclusion of patentability of uh, mathematical models, as well as schemes, rules, and methods for performing mental acts. So having a software um, which has a lot of mathematical algorithms and um, models uh, would be difficult to, to be patented. So um, why it's difficult to get a software patent? First of all, software patents are very interpretable. And um, sometimes courts um, just um, kind of fight over um, what is the technical effect being produced by a software. So they need to define actually um, how technical the software is. is. Is there any kind of real improvement of, in the real world? Of, of a specific product based on a software application or not? And if yes, in how far? So um, since we have also very uh, rapid technological changes in the innovations, um, these software patents, they are getting um, very fast out of, um, let's say, relevance and their value decrease. Normally you need between three and five years to get a, 
um, patent at the European Patent Office. So once you take the patent in five years, maybe the software solution is not going to be of any value anymore, and it will be obsolete more or less. So, um, <clears throat> so um, before you make the decision to file a patent uh, on a software, maybe it will make sense to, as I said, um, even before, uh, have a look at the different uh, other ways of protecting your intellectual property rights, namely um, keeping your software, let's say, idea, a trade secret, because once you have a patent, you need to disclose the information um, in a way which is reproducible, which means everybody can reproduce it based on the patent that you have filed. So this disclosure in many cases is not desirable because it allows many companies to reverse engineer what your idea is. So um, maybe you can keep the trade secret and then you have the database rights, as I said. In Europe, it's called a sui generis. Um, this is a special protection um, of its own kind, as I mentioned. It has a validity of 15 years. Um, and um, once you compile the database, you can protect it under this copyright um, uh, similar intellectual property right. And the last one is the copyrights. As we said, softwares are always copyrighted. So now I'm uh, directing your attention to the topic of uh, neural networks, because um, as you know, many of those neural networks will be used in artificial intelligence. Special algorithms will be developed in order to tap into the data, which is in the, um, also in the big data across database systems. So um, normally machine learning algorithms are, as we, man as we said, mathematical models, which means by law, by the European Patent Convention, they will be automatically excluded by patentability. So we have this exemption from protection. However, applied to certain problem, an algorithm may become part of a patent, as we said. And here I will give you one example, which is of Google. Um, they managed to patent an algorithm which is a neural network and I extracted the first claim of this algorithm where you can see that this algorithm was a hardware integrated circuit so this is a software solution which was integrated on a hardware which gave the possibility of Google to get a patent on this some should that not be easily applicable on hardware inventions or existing products hardware products um, it would be far more difficult to get a patent on that so you see under the number 300, uh, this is a compute system which uses different um, um, operated compute units. This is the max. And um, in this 102, this is the, the first memory um, storage system. You store a non-zero um, data, which will be generated by the max. So um, this is a patent which was granted recently, um, I think in on the 14th of November this year. So to wrap up, uh, as we said, IP rights are intangible assets of companies which could guarantee exclusivity um, by specific products and services and um, inventions, brands, uh, different other kinds of intellectual property protection rights. Uh, as we say, open so uh, source software, um, they renounce the copyrights, they give you the opportunity to develop and a different version or derivative of softwares and reproduce it without the need to comply with any um, IP rights as, um, apart from of course the copyrights that we mentioned. Um, in most cases artificial intelligence software is protected by copyrights in general um, and as we said it's very difficult to get a software patent um, and to enforce it in many cases because in order to enforce it you have to prove that somebody stole your software idea and implemented it somewhere which is very difficult to implement. I have in my uh, area for example in immobility hardware patents which are difficult to prove um, of infringement normally so software will be even more difficult. So, um, actually, that's it. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, even afterwards, after our discussion and session. So, thank you. Well, Very good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So, 
before we go to the break, we have a little present for you. Now, while he's preparing it, um, we need another five minutes or so to do that. Meanwhile, our meetup is growing, growing a lot. So I'm wondering how many people are here. This really will take some time to come. Maybe you can just help me out. Really. One, say it loud. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, let's do first here. 10, 11, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, ah, shit, counting, difficult. 21, 22, 23, 24. And seven twenty eight four five seven eight it's over a hundred damn was is preparing these meetups uh really when we were below fifty people it's easy to find a hole at this size hosting 100 people not every company can so if you by whatever reason to me or to Laysa, because this is a limit that we reach now it's really difficult to find a big space in munich yeah we know munich complicated and for january we'll have one but we do need speakers so we have a good topic then please uh, talk to us as well. You ready? Okay, do we need your screen share again back? Okay, do that. Oh, infinite. Okay, so we have a raffle for you and Laisa will tell you how it works. So hello everyone. So today we're gonna play this game uh, on Kahoot, so I would say just Come here and scan the QR code or enter. You don't need to the applicate uh, application. You don't need it. Just do that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Bring it. So we have some books uh, today to give it to you. One is this book, great book from Fluent Python. It's from Luciano Romaglio, the second edition. And we have right also here. You, I would say. So it's yes. Blessed, blessed, by <laughs> blessed by him. He's always cooperating with us. And uh, yeah, he's a great Brazilian writer. <laughs> very, very, very good. And this other one is the Architecture Partners with Python, which is also a quite great book. So let's see, let's see. I just need one moment. I will put it back. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Uh, I will put it back. Don't worry. Share the screen. It's always hard to share the screen. But OK, now I think it would be, it would be bigger for you to see. So yeah, how many people we have it here? Let's see. Please put some name in that we can identify you somehow. <laughs> so we have around 82 people. But yeah, for this game, you don't need to know Python, actually. So if you are willing to learn, this is the chance to get booked for it. And we're going to just uh, try to answer with our best. I also don't know the answers, so don't worry <laughs> if you don't know. But the thing is, you have to be fast. And there were people here who are very fast, right? <laughs> And maybe this time they will get more things or something. So let's see, let's see. It could be challenging. It could be easy. Well, you have some 25% of chance. So we are around 83 and I don't see so many people, 84. So I think we can start soon. Let's chance, let's chance. Start lowering, oh my God. <laughs> he doesn't have internet, someone share. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Did you get any? <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> you started with the wrong internet provider. <laughs> yes, yes, maybe you can ask someone from your side. Uh, 
Yeah, we are 88, so some people are still entering. Who else? Who else? Let's let's hit the hundreds. <laughs> so 89. Let's see, let's see. Where is okay, maybe with ninth I should stop. Okay, what do you think? Yes, so one more person. Enter. <laughs> It's not happening. I think I will enter and then I can start it. <laughs> Someone help me. It's leaving. <laughs> it's the connection, I think. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to start it. Sorry, sorry. 87. Yeah, otherwise I will lose people. <laughs> so we're going to start it now. So let's see. Let's see what's about. So scientific factors, because of today's uh, today meetup is very scientific related. I thought maybe we can have scientific facts about Christmas. So which scientists introduced Christmas tree lights to the public in 1880? Ah, okay, okay, please remove it. Okay, okay, good, good. 50, 58, 60, 64. Oh my God, you have one second. <laughs> It's Edward Johnson. A lot of people thought it was Nikola Tesla. I also thought. <laughs> so not bad, not bad. Who is Winnie? Freddy. Freddy and F. <laughs> Whatever F means. <laughs> so let's go to the next. Before electric lights were strung on Christmas tree, what did people use to illuminate them? Animals, I don't know. <laughs> so players type your answer. Oh, this is hard. This is this is the killer. So a lot of people would just die in this one. So keep playing. <laughs> so probability is that very few will get it right. So let's see. I'm curious. Is it uh, case sensitive? Is also I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, that would be me. <laughs> but let's see. Let's see. You have three seconds. You need to type fast. <laughs> but almost everyone answer. Oh my God, candle, 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 fire, fire, candle. Okay, even, even if you type it wrong, I think there is some magical search here. <laughs> so you're lucky, you're lucky. Uh, candle, great, great. Makes sense, right? There is no electricity. So Freddy is still on top. Uh, I don't know who is Freddy. But other, anything can happen. And Wella was doing very good in some meetups before, so maybe she will. <laughs> she will catch you. <laughs> Christmas light will tango do it to entropy. Billions of ways to tango, only way to fix. Is this a joke? <laughs> True or false? Wow, 50. You need to be fast and you need to be right, okay? So it's not only you are right, uh, because it will account for the speed. 85. But everyone is trying, there is 50% chance, so... <laughs> Ooh, true! Let's see. Freddy, Freddy. If Freddy is close to you, maybe you... you... <laughs> what scientific fact would argue that Santa's reindeer are all female? Ooh, this is interesting. They fur is brown, they still have the ants. I think it could be related to fur, but I don't want to influence you. They tails have a white patch on them. They work in pairs. I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Females work in pairs, apparently. <laughs> weird. Okay, there's... Okay, five, four, three. Answer, answer, answer. Just try. Yay. Okay, they still have the enters in the later December. So that's how they know that... Probably they were famous. Oh, Freddy. Ah, uh, DT, I think is a company. <laughs> oh, let's see. True or false? Most reindeer are buoyant and can float in the water. Ah, guys, I don't know English so well. I would get it wrong. <laughs> What's buoyant means? Bo floating, floating. Okay, floatable. Floating water. Okay. I, f I mean, floating or s uh, swimming? Okay, okay, let's see. I trust you, I trust you. Uh, half of the people thought that's uh, okay. Half got wrong, half got right. Eh, hey, Freddy. <laughs> but we have two books, so the second person will also get a book. 
Let's go to the next one. Which of the following statements about reindeer is false? They really like this animal, right? Some can have red nose. They can float in water. Males <laughs> shed their antlers in winter. They cannot see well at night. I also cannot see well. I think only cats can see well. Uh, yeah, let's see. 65, 68. Ooh. Let's... It, this was so fast <laughs> that you answer before the time. I'm very proud of you. Uh, but yeah, they cannot see well at night. You see? Could be that I'm a reindeer. Eugenie, Eugenie, you are playing. Oyada, Paul, Freddy, and Aunt Al. Okay, it's, it's, you see, you still can win because those people, they just uh, get out of the podium. So which NASA Apollo mission first confirmed that is a Santa Claus? They confirmed this? <laughs> No, kidding. They were kidding. They thought uh, they are considering aliens, Santa Claus, and everything else. It's not possible. But yeah, it looks like it's Apollo is the right first word. <laughs> this was hard. This was hard. I agree. I agree. But let's see. Okay, Minik, uh, it's uh, coming. <laughs> let's go to the next. In which direction should Santa travel from the international deadline to not lose any time? I don't want to question this. <laughs> Maybe he should not take some train, I think. <laughs> Let's see, 60, north, south, east, west. Who is good in geography? Ooh, west, 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 west. Great, this was... Eugenie now is uh, really uh, leading. Minik is also leading. Let's see. Given the 2.2 billion children on Earth, about how far does Santa have to travel Christmas even? Oh my God, the speed of light. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Calculate very fast. <laughs> you have 10 seconds. <laughs> so what do you think? If Santa would visit all the children, it would be amazing, right? That all children would get something nice in Christmas. That would be amazing. 80... Okay, 150. Mm, wow, a lot. Yeah, miles, but okay, they put in kilometers. You have some idea. Okay, me. Me? Okay. <laughs> Alina is also almost there. You have two more questions. According to physics, about how fast must Santa is late travel on Christmas Eve? Wow, 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 wow. Wait. <laughs> Let's take a look on these numbers. So what do you think? What do you think? Answer, answer, answer. Eight, seven, six. You have a few seconds. Don't give up. If you didn't show up, you don't know. Maybe now it's your time. This one is hard. So you see, it's some people are sad. So I think changes are, things are changing. <laughs> Me is winning. <laughs> let's, let's go. Let's go. Who invented the idea of Christmas cards? I thought, yeah, who, who did it? I think the European person, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Richard Draw, Thomas Edson, Robert May, Han Kohler. Okay, this is the last question. So we're going to see who we're going to get this prize. I will give the first one for the first winner this one. And the second winner, this one. Are you all? Ah, oh, who it is? Who it is? <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Ta 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 ta. Me. Ooh. And Sophia. Sophia. Ooh. Oh my God. I guess Pine Ladies won it. <laughs> I didn't give the answer to them. <laughs> come here. Come here. <laughs> so, me, right? Yes, come here. Make a photo. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> How is the photo? Right? <laughs> Let's take photo together. One more. Good. We have it. Woohoo! So, Congratulations. Congratulations, congratulations. So what do you say? Should we let people have their break now? Yes, now you can have a break. You are exhausted of working on Christmas quiz. <laughs> but 
but we have <laughs> five more talks, but they are short. Short, lightning talk, yes, short yes. And fun. So please help yourself get some beer and let's play some music. Uh -huh.
And it's time to continue, finally. I would kindly ask you to be quiet because we have the next session now. We have one more, oh, let's mute here. We have one more like a uh, big talk and we will have three lightning talks and all are fun, believe it or not, all are fun. We will be quick and uh, maybe we will also stay for as long as NetLight is not kicking us out, make here a party. At open the doors to the crowds, finish their beer. Let's see, let's see how this ends. So for now, please, I would need a big round of applause for Andre. Is it better? Yeah, fine. We need to turn on this one. Does it work? Right. Oh. I'm trying. Very yeah, good. works. Yeah. All right, go for it. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here today and talk um, about LLMs for a change. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm uh, working with DStack, uh, which is an open source tool for uh, for running Gen AI models in the cloud. Uh, but the topic of today's uh, presentation is uh, not DStack, but uh, open source LLMs and how to use them in production. And before I begin, a uh, quick, um, quick um, question about like how many of you are doing anything with LLMs, open source LLMs, uh, or all right? Yeah, quite a few. Um, and also curious about LLMs thinking of, of doing something with them uh, in the short term future. All right, um, it's, it's always difficult to find the right balance uh, uh, between uh, like uh, uh, beginner level and uh, more advanced. So I am aiming for, aiming for some, some middle common ground here. So if you don't know anything about LLMs, um, bear with me. Uh, but still, if you are an expert in LLMs, um, it's, uh, I'm not going to go into like great depth here, uh, but let's see how it goes. So first of all, um, basically LLM, uh, you can think of it as chat GPT. Uh, and um, how many are, uh, of you using or used uh, chat GPT? So you, you already have some, some understanding of what an LLM is and how it, how it works. So, but but today we are going to talk about open open source LLM. So, what is the difference? Um, uh, ChatGPT is powered by um, GPT, um, two different versions of uh, GPT uh, by OpenAI, and uh, there are also there is also such a thing as open source LLMs. Basically, LLMs that built by the community and uh, they come with an open source license means that you can use them for free. Means that you can fine tune them. Um, and you can uh, deploy them. Um, and today we, we're going to talk about why to do that, uh, how how this can be done, and all of that. So the, the first thing is why open source LLMs anyway. So given that we have already OpenAI and ChatGPT, why bother and, and uh, why open source uh, really matter? So a couple of things. Um, number one, if you watch this drama recently about this uh, OpenAI at all, uh, some users were really were uh, like worried uh, about whether they uh, uh, business is, is going to, to stay in the market because all they all of the APIs depend depend on a, a proprietary LLM and um, that's the problem if, if your application depends on proprietary model which you cannot control and you uh, barely know if this model may change or um, overnight um, and everything might might stop working. Um, that's one of the reasons to use open source LLMs, uh, where you always know what version is deployed and you have entire control of that. Um, and you can also do different tests and see if this model works. Um, you, you can do different deployment and then roll back at any time. Um, second um, important thing is customization. Um, that's the best part. Uh, open source LLMs are all about community. Means that if somebody release, releases an open source LLMs, means that everyone can build on top of that LLM. You can you can um, deploy this LLM, or you can build on top of this LLM and fine tune it uh, to um, to solve some specific problem. 
um, and then share this result of yours um, with, with everyone else um, in the community as well. So then privacy, of course, uh, it's a big topic right now. A lot of companies are um, exploring what, what it means basically in terms of privacy to use proprietary model, and how safe it is. Um, um, and uh, open source LMs give you um, a great control over this because because you control um, everything, the data um, that is used to train the model and also the data that, that is fed into the, into the model. Um, and finally, costs. Uh, cost is a big topic. Um, and if, if you if you used uh, OpenAI open, open AI's model, you might know that well uh, the the large model is might be expensive, especially if you use it a lot. Uh, in, in your applications, your bill may be really uh, high, uh, so you you, need, you you might need to to pay a lot. On the other hand, uh, the OpenAI also has this cheaper model called GPT three point five. Uh, which is a lot um, easier to use. Um, um, however, um, in, in case you uh, do plan to use uh, the, the LLM very heavily, it might make a lot of sense to, to use a much smaller model and, um, and host it yourself. And that, that's why open source LLMs can, can come to rescue. So by no, uh, by no chance, I aim to... Um, like uh, mention every major open source release in this talk, but I'll mention a few uh, most important releases here. Um, again, if you are into this topic, you already know, but but um, if, if L open source LLMs is something that you'd like to explore, um, start with uh, these three. So Llama 2, this is a model uh, released a couple of months ago by Meta, and it is offered in partnership with Microsoft. This is one of their uh like best best quality wise models and it comes with different sizes 7 billion parameters to 10 billion parameters and 70 billion parameters again if you don't know anything what what about what parameters are you can think of this as um as the size of the model and we'll talk more about uh what what size really means um well the smaller model is cheap uh, it it is cheaper to to use it in production less less hardware um you you need to to, to host it and etc. So Llama 2 is a very gen general model. It, 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 it um, gives you a very good quality um, and it has an um, open source license, um, which means that you can use it commercially for free. Right. Um, another model which which worth uh, um, to, to mention is Code Llama. This is also a model by Meta, but it is a fine-tuned version of Llama 2 where they fine tune it on um, on solving um, code generation tasks. So it is very good at very specific thing, generating code. So why it is uh, in, like in, very important. When, when you talk to, let's say, chat GPT, you might ask it questions, you can ask the, the model to do something, and then you basically um, operate with the, um, you um, communicate with the, with the model. However, uh, L and LLM can not only generate na native um, natural language, but it also may, may generate uh, computer language, like for example, take JSON or take SQL. Uh, and this is a very powerful use case because then you can um, make LLM to act on your behalf and automate stuff. So for example, one very quick um, example is um, you can ask, um, an LLM a question, and an LLM can give you an answer in the form of SQL query, and then it can automatically run this SQL query and get you data which you ask it for. So, or another another example is use LLMs to automate stuff. And finally, Mistral. Uh, this is a more recent model. And as you see, it, it's offered only in one size, very small size. Uh, it's uh, built by Mistral AI. Um, and um, what makes it Also, this model, this just like Lama 2 and Code Lama, they are all 
commercially um, like uh, can be used commercially. Um, and also Mistral is very customizable, but we'll talk about it too. So Llama 2 uh, 70B at glance. So this is their largest version of Llama 2. On their left hand side, you see a lot of benchmarks. Uh, a benchmark is something that you use in order to tell how, how good the quality of the model is. So for example, the first one is the most popular one. It's um, massive multitask language understanding. Um, it rates how model good at a pretty wide range of different tasks. And here you can see um, how Llama 2 compares to GPT 3.5, GPT 4, and some other models. So this, this data comes from the original Llama 2 paper. But what, what is basically worth, worth your attention here is that Llama 2, you can see that um, at, at some of their benchmarks, it comes really close to GPT 3.5. So it means that it's comparable in, in terms of the quality, but it also lags behind in terms of quality compared to GPT 4. Uh, so it gives you a feeling how, how good the open source models are in terms of the quality. Um, also, uh, a, a quick note on Mistral 7B, why this model is, is worth attention. Uh, basically, uh, the data on, on different uh, benchmarks shows that it beats not only other models of the same size, but it also beats uh, twice as large models. So basically, it, it beats uh, Lama, Lama to 13 billion parameters. And then it also matches the performance and some tasks, um, the uh, Lama, Lama 1, 34 billion parameters. So this is a pretty powerful uh, small model. And in terms of model size, you may wonder, OK, so how, how do these open source LLMs compare to ChatGPT, uh, uh, which, which is using GPT-4 and GPT-3.5? So yeah, you, you can see. Well, you cannot see, but basically, because of the color. Here is a very large um, circle. Uh, <laughs> sorry about the colors. Um, which, which, is, which, which, which shows you the size of GPT-4. Uh, and then, well, basically, um, GPT 3.5 is a lot smaller one. Uh, and then you can see that uh, Llama 2 is uh, is almost like uh, three three times uh, smaller. And <laughs> this slide is really bad, but uh, Mistral is not is not seen here because yeah, you you see the video uh, here. But <laughs> think of it think of it as a as a dot basically. It's uh, if, if you compare Mistral to GPT-4, it's just a dot. Um, but still, um, it, it's um, it's interesting to see that um, that even using even smaller model, you you can achieve uh, quite uh, the, you can achieve the quality that matched of GPT-4 or uh, exceed it, and we'll we'll see how it works. So here's the here's the data from their study by Snowflake that shows how you can leverage a small model uh, for solving very specific tasks. So what they did, they, comp uh, they collected a data set for code generation and uh, basically generates in SQL queries. And then they fine-tuned that model. And then they compared how, they, how, how this fine-tuned model matched their, matched their the quality of a larger model. So they compared it with two other models of, of much greater size. And what you see here, that basically the fine-tuned version of the small model actually matches. Uh, and it matches not only this larger models, but it also comes quite close to GPT-4. So uh, the takeaway here is that um, if you fine tune a small model right away, it can actually come, come really close in terms of the quality to GPT-4. Uh, again, this is just a single study and there are many others. And um, as we speak, there's uh, ongoing progress here. So there are new models appear. Uh, so we can expect that um, smaller models um, uh, will rival basically their GPT-4 for, for as a in 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 terms of ease of use and costs uh, and also uh, control. So here's another example of uh, how how you can uh, take an open source LLM and fine tune it and how it might compare to to GPT-4. So uh, here we we see two other models: Wizard Coder, 34 uh, billion parameters and find version two. Um, of similar size. Um, and basically, there are lots of uh, benchmarks uh, you're not familiar with. 
But what is important here is basically the, look at the first line, human eval. Human eval is a benchmark that is used to measure how, like score, how, how great an LLM at solving coding problems. So you can see that Find and Wizard Coder actually come really close to, to GPT-4. And there, there was a funny story when, when these uh, models actually were released, they actually uh, bet their, bit the quality of GPT-4 uh, and within a week, OpenAI uh, updated their model to uh, catch up, and basically they they are again the first number number one um, in their in their leaderboard. So um, now uh, we're going to talk a bit more about how how actually to use what it what it means to use uh, open source LLMs. Right, um, it LLMs are very a very heavy when it comes to, to using these models for fine tuning or deployment. So here we, this is the slide from there, some application that calculates how much memory you need for serving or for training for, for an open source model. So here we have this Llama 2, 70 billion parameters. Um, and if you, we take it in the or original precision, this is another thing to, to know. Uh, basically, an LLM is just a set of weights, basically numbers, float point numbers. So there are so many float, num uh, float point numbers that we have 70 billion parameters. And in order to, to use this model, we would need uh, 256 uh, gigabytes of, of GPU memory. Means that it doesn't even fit into any, any known GPU, uh, which, which makes it, uh, which make you, might make you wonder how, how to use this model at all. And if you decide to, to fine tune this model, uh, basically, uh, to train uh, this model, then it would require one terabyte of, of GPU memory, which means that, well, it's really hard to, to fit it into one single GPU, which means that you're going to use multiple GPUs in order to, to train this model. But we'll talk about optimization techniques uh, uh, in their in their further slides. So here here we we have some data that that gives you an idea of what it means in terms of latency and cost to to use uh, an open source LLM in a, in like in deploy uh, for deployment. Um, lots of numbers, but what what let me uh, walk you through this um, table. So on the left uh, hand side, you see different models. Uh, 7 billion parameters, 13 billion parameters, and the largest llama, 70 billion parameters, and then um, this study is by Hugging Face. What they basically uh, did, um, they they took uh, the corresponding GPU that that matched their requirement, um, and then they uh, calculated what it costs to uh, per hour and also to generate one million tokens. So if you use the smallest Llama model for generating 1 million tokens, um, you, would, you would pay basically $32, which is pretty expensive. And for if you are using the largest model, um, then you would pay $500. Um, uh, and here we're using the largest AWS instance that they can offer. It's, uh, it's eight uh, GPUs, so 8100, uh, sorry, yes, 8100. Uh, 80 gigabytes each. So it's, it's the, 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 the largest instance AWS has. Right, so it's still pretty expensive. And also you see there, uh, you see the latency numbers here. Um, and latency is something that you would probably worry a lot when you deploy a model, because in the end, it's all about performance. Um, here, we only have one concurrent request here. And if, if we're using the largest model and we're using the largest instance GPU uh, AWS actually offers, then we, we're, gonna, we're gonna end up having 41 second, um, millisecond per token, uh, which is still okay, but, but you can see that it's really hard to, to use a model uh, without any optimization techniques. So that, that's why uh, here, here comes the first optimization techniques um, uh, known as quantization. Um, as I, as I told you, a model is a set of weights, basically for all point numbers. Uh, and in order to, to use it for training or for inference, we have to load this into memory, GPU memory. Um, FP16, this is also known as half precision. It's uh, not the full precision, but not for float point uh, 32, but float point 16. Um, so a lot of models actually use this, this half, half, 
this half precision. So it's really difficult to fit it into the memory. So if, you, if you'd like to reduce significantly the amount of memory needed to, to use in, for using this model, uh, you might consider using quantization. Um, and this works this way. Uh, instead of using load point 16, we're using, let's say, int 8. And we are using this quantization to transform uh, with losing some, some precision, some, some quality, uh, we reduce the amount of, of, of weights. But this technique is super powerful and it shows that if, if um, well, with a lot of, mo well, the, most, most of the research is, is showing that um, you can use it without the loss of their quality, use it pretty much, um, int eight. But also you can consider going even lower precision and you can consider using it in using it in four, in two, and maybe even <laughs> lower. But that's that, that's another topic to discuss. And uh, here's another um, uh, calculator screenshot that shows um, how the memory requirements changes if you are going lower precision. So the the same model, lama two seventy billion quantized, with, with yeah. So half half precision. We basically divide by two the amount of memory. Still don't fit. We 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 still cannot fit into one single GPU. But then we use int eight, and now we can actually start to 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 be able to to use one one GPU with this model. But then we can go lower. And then on the very uh, right, uh, you also see how the requirement for training changes. But you, but you still see that uh, even with the lowest precision, you cannot use it for training. Right. Here's an updated slide, uh, which, which you've seen before. We, we chose latency and cost, um, but now with quantized um, uh, technique, you can look at the uh, right right hand side that we basically uh, uh, saved a lot of money. Basically, the the cost uh, drops uh, ten times, um, and it's a lot easier to use it uh, with even smaller uh, instances that AWS, for example, provides. Right. Um, what about training? Um, so he here you, you can see that training is still very expensive uh, and you need a lot of GPU. Uh, so for the rescue, uh, 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 we, we can use this technique called LoRa or also known as low rank adaptation. So this how this techniques works in a like let me briefly um, explain. So if you if you imagine um, the weight of the model, basically this float point uh, um, numbers, weights, uh, which are very difficult to fit into the GPU memory in order to train. We do an optimization here. We take only a smaller subset of all these weights and we call it an adapter. Um, and then we train this adapter, lower rank adapter, um, instead of training the entire, set of weights, and once we've trained it, then we merge this low, uh, lower set subset of weights called adapter with the, with the original model. Uh, and then we get a trained model, but um, instead of fitting everything into the memory, we only put in the subset of it. Um, again, there is a paper if, if you'd like to know better how to use it, but that's one of the most prof like um, foundational technique here for LLMs. Um, which which allows to to train large language models without again a very significant loss of quality. Um, and here's um, here's one more um, table that that shows how if you take for example Falcon is is another open source model, and you take um, it's probably the largest uh, open source model not known today, um, and it, it it shows how the how the requirements drop um, if you are using LoRa, and then you also combine it with quantization. So the third line here, it's called QLoRa. It's it means it it combination of quantization with LoRa. So you combine two techniques here, and you can see that basically um, you you drop the memory requirements um, like ridiculous amount. Of, uh, Ridiculously, it's it's like uh, more than, um, yeah, 30, 30 times. 
Right. So um, how powerful fine-tuning really is. Um, so again, how, how many of you are familiar with, with what, what fine-tuning word means, if you can raise your hands? So fine-tuning is basically you take a, a base model already trained by someone, um, and then you, you do an additional step of training, but you are using some other data set that you want to use to tailor the, the model for. For example, we have a general model that can do everything, and then we take a co-generation subset, and then we like post-train or fine-tune the model on this subset to make sure that this model is specialized in this particular thing. So that that's uh, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I like bears. <laughs> Some LLM interfering into the, into the talk, <laughs> which likes bears. Um, so, uh, so how powerful fine tuning is? Uh, we already know that it can be super expensive and it it, it can be super um, heavy in terms of memory and, and uh, uh, time wise. Um, but here's another study by Anyscale now another company that they took um, the smallest llama too. And then they used different two two different ways to fine tune it. Um, basically, LoRa and the standard one. Basically, to compare how powerful the LoRa technique is, uh, and then they compared it also with a fine tuned version of larger models. And they also they took three different problems. One is uh, uh, functional representation. The first one is it's when you take uh, an unstructured data and then you ask an LLM to provide you structured data. So, for example, you, you take a scan of invoice and tell, okay, so give me struct this the data from this invoice in structured uh, form. Like, who is this invoice from? Like, what is the amount at all? Second is SQL generation, and third one is solving math problems. And what we see here is that basically on the first two uh, sets of problems. We, we see that LoRa um, fine-tuning technique it matched actually the, the, the quality of the standard technique. And then we, what, what it really means is that we can take the smallest model and we can apply these techniques for fine-tuning and the result, resulted model, resulting model can match the quality of much larger models trained without this optimization technique. Meaning means that it's super efficient and it's super cost-effective. Uh, cost, cost um, so this is this might 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 you might find it scary, like too too many things here, um, and I'll try to simplify this. So basically, um, if if we'd like to fine tune a model, uh, there are different ways to fine tune a model. The the simplest way is called supervised fine tuning. You basically create a special data set of uh, that looks exactly. For example, to give you an example. You, if you ask an LLM to provide you, I don't know, a poem, um, then we can, for example, have a lot of different poems and fit them into the LLM, and an LLM will learn through these examples uh, how to generate poems. This is called supervised fine tuning. You only need to um, to to bring some additional high quality data, um, but then. It's it's not the only way, and there are more powerful way. And I am afraid that we're not gonna have time to cover them all. Um, but I'd like to just mention that um, uh, there are other ways. Like one way is, uh, is most um, complex and most efficient, called reinforcement learning, human feedback, RLHF. Again, if you dive into LLMs, you'll learn about it, and then um, when when you you learn more how it works, it's not gonna look really complex at all all you all you need to to do to like to to use this uh, is is um, not only provide the data set but also provide additional ranking this this piece of like this um, uh, this for example poem is good this poem is not good so you are not only telling uh, showing poems to your model, but you also tell like which more which poems are good and which more poems are bad. So basically, you provide feedback. This is the 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 main thing. Um, well, I'll probably conclude um, <laughs> because we are probably going too deep here. 
Um, again, if, if you decide to uh, to go deeper, there is also alternative, much simpler alternative to LRLHF, uh, which is pretty pretty effective. And um, again, if you if you'd like to to go even deeper, there are other things that uh, might uh, uh, be super super efficient when it comes to to basically running deploying deploying the the LLMs. Um, I'll be sharing slides anyway, so I'll, I'll share them later. So if if if, if someone is, is interested, you'll you'll find about this. Yeah, I guess that's that's all. Beautiful. <laughs> Big applause. <laughs> lovely, lovely. All right, we still have the most fun part of this meetup: lightning talks. Those who don't know, Lightning Talk is a format when we have just five minutes maximum to, uh, to, for a speaker to present something. And we have maybe even one extra slot if we are on time. So if anybody will spontaneously want to present something about Python, you're very welcome to do so. Please, Laisa is the first with a talk, announcement, I don't know. Uh, let's put her slides here. We also take the fast microphone. Boom. Are you sharing? Yeah, let's see. OK, now you are. All hello, right. hello. So this is very short lightning talk. Really, really, really short. Really, really, really uh, lightning. So uh, one question. Do you like bears? Yes, no, depends. Yes, who say yes? OK, who say no? Uh, I think you know already what I'm talking. Depends? <laughs> Okay, some people say depends. So depends, right? Maybe you like this kind of bear, the teddy bear. Uh, maybe you are scared of this kind of bear. Uh, I want to know if you like this kind of bear. So there will be an event next year it's called PyCon DE and PyData happening in Berlin, a city where you can hunt bears in a nice way because they are status. And we have some tickets to give uh, for Py ladies. So here actually it doesn't show up so well, but okay. So if you are PyLadies Munich, this is a QR code where you have the chance to apply for a ticket. We have decided this year we're gonna run a process to grant some tickets for the community, for the people who need or for people who knows, but apply it anyway. And we will consider your as an applicant. So this is the QR code. I will add in the PyLadies Munich later if you don't get it here. But yeah, I would love to see you there and take a lot of people from Pilates Munich to Berlin next year. Right. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Laisa, how do we increase the chances? How the person can get better chances? So if you really need a ticket, uh, please apply. And if you don't need, apply too. Who knows? <laughs> But uh, we, will, we will try to give it to the people who need. Uh, so if you're a student and yeah, we all have been there and it would be nice to give to someone who can join. Is it 100% fair or is there some? It is fair, it will be fair. I'm a fair person. All right. Very good. <laughs> Thanks to my ladies then, yes. Okay, um, you girls are ready. Boom, yeah, you hold this. Okay, we need a presentation. Uh, you're sharing it, yes? Ah, oh, you need to Wi-Fi. It's okay. Don't worry. Okay, we need this. I'm remind you, uh, reminding you that these girls and there are two more, two more, there, and there who traveled from Ukraine to just visit us here. So I think that's cool, and it deserves yet another applause. <laughs> And at the end of this talk, I'm sure I will ask you again for applause because that's just the way it is. So we need... <laughs> good, good. Thank you very much. So something went wrong here, but we will do it again now. Okay. Do this whole thing. Mute, yeah. Okay, now present. Very good. Yes, that should that should work. Okay, do we have it now? 
Very good. I think that this is also a good point to ask you for applause for Mr. Eugene over there, who is doing the whole streaming thing. <laughs> All right. Here you go. Please. Hello, everyone. My name is Alina. Hi, I'm Valeria. And we're so excited to be here to buy Munich and buy Ladies Christmas Meetup. So when you at Tech5 and being part of this event is truly meaningful for us. So today we'd like to talk about dealing with self-doubt in the tech industry. I've been working in tech industry for more than two years. And from first days I work in here, uh, I have doubts. Am I working? good am i working well and i know in this room many of you may feel the same may have doubts about their knowledge their skills uh so alina could you say us if it's okay to feel what we feel of course it's perfectly okay to feel doubts about your skills and abilities even after many years of experience and these feelings often come together under the term imposter syndrome. While it's important to recognize this syndrome in yourself, as it can have a negative impact on your career and mental health. Well, here are some signs to look for. While you feel like you don't deserve your success, you worry that you are going to be exposed as a fraud. You were taking on challenges and opportunities for fear of failure, you have difficulty accepting compliments and compare yourself to others and feel inferior. And now let's explore the underlying causes of these feelings. Well, Valeria, please share your insights. But before I tell you the reasons why you can feel imposter syndrome, I would to emphasize that it's uh, it's possible to cope with particular problem you have with your imposter syndrome. You just want, need to um, recognize your problem and then we can suggest a possible way to control it. So it's doable, believe us. So why you can feel imposter syndrome? Maybe you're a perfectionist. You're uh, concentrated not just doing your job, but doing your job perfectly. You compare your results with someone else and you uh, associate your self-worth with uh, your uh, quality of your job. But these things are not equal. Well, if you are a perfectionist, it can be helpful to learn to love the process at not only their end goal, to celebrate small wins and not hold off for the big ones only. Understand that making mistakes are the only way to learn effectively and concentrate on your successes, not your failures. So uh, maybe you frequently uh, feel exhausted because you're a superhuman. You work even you don't have to and uh, you just want to hide your doubts about quality or quantity of your job. If you find yourself overworking day after day, it's important to set boundaries and recognize the benefit of rest. By prioritizing the task with the greatest impact, you can maintain the healthier work-life balance. Yeah, here's another type of people, self-reliant. They never ask for help because they are afraid to be perceived as a fraud. But the main way, uh, the the one way to um, to strat this, the main strategy to overcome it is to view uh, for seeking help and seeking help as a sign of uh, strength and not weakness. And what about self-reliant perfectionists? They are, have assumption that they are genius, but um, yeah, <laughs> they, they think that they know everything, but when they face something hard, they uh, turn on self-sabotage because of their unrealistic, uh, unrealistic expectations about themselves. So it's essential to realize that making slow progress is still a progress. Understand that you will never know everything in your field and seek feedback from your mentor on your role expectations. Uh, and there's one more type of people, they are experts. Um, 
honestly, that's me. And <laughs> and uh, these people uh, uh, think uh, uh, they, they people think they are frauds when they don't know something, and they start procrastinating till they learn everything to start this uh, work because uh, they think when they start learn everything, they will know everything, and then they are worth to do this job. And the solution here is obvious. Just learn only what you need, when you need it. Yep. <laughs> In conclusion, sorry. <laughs> In conclusion, imposter syndrome is the thing that many of us can face, uh, but it doesn't define us. Uh, it's possible to overcome it, but it's e it's it's important to say that uh, if you can't control your imposter imposter syndrome, but your by yourself, uh, you should take care of yourself and consult a psychologist. It's not a sign of weakness; it's a sign of uh, of strength. Yeah, and remember, uh, you belong here. You, your skills are valid. Your voice matters. Let's build a community that supports and uplifts each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Yule is the next one. Yule is the next one. You put this on. Yeah, girls. I like the way when I went on the stage, how Alina did like. Go. <laughs> it was it, it, well, sort of like a sign, like I don't belong to this talk. Maybe I don't. I think I do deserve success. I, I am imposter. I do deserve success. But I, I was questioning where is my yacht? Where is my stuff? But then I see this meetup, and I think, ah, this is success. This is maybe cooler than a yacht. So, I'm, I'm happy about this. You have to be creative, you know. You, this is yeah. The, Yulia, this is a part of the job, you see, this is, you have to manage, or are you imposter on this stage? No, no. I heard this talk uh, from Yulia on PyCon Czech Republic and people liked it, so. So, now second time. Can we hear you? Can we hear me? Do yes, now it now. It Hello. Okay. I mean, it looks good anyway, so <laughs> let it be like this, please. Now everyone Apl hear me. Great. Applause for you, Leah, please. Oh. Yeah, yes. Okay. So. Okay. It seems like I need to put more jokes, which <laughs> is getting difficult towards the end of the evening. So we need this. We can do exercises. We Present. can plow. We Share can screen. yell. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, back. Okay, so Better. let's start. We need a blessing from Eugene. Yes. So our talk will be Alexa. And before going to the talk, I want to introduce myself. I'm Yulia Barabash, and I am cloud engineer that likes to work with the cloud, that likes to work with different libraries, and also that likes to go different tech, uh, tech events. But sometimes it's very hard to keep track of all events and what's going on, like Python conferences, meetups, and so on. But maybe there's some stuff at home that can help us. For example, we can ask Alexa. Because Alexa is nice tools. For example, you can ask what's the weather today. You can also ask to set up alarm for 7 a.m. Also set up timer. Even tell a joke. She has very nice of humor. If you bet, have bad mood, you just can ask her, uh, tell me a joke, and you will feel better. But how we can give her additional skills? So... Uh, with Alexa, there's also possibility to teach her some new stuff. For example, I don't know, maybe you want to deploy your environment from Alexa. Tell, okay, deploy to production and it can give you. <laughs> it can be very nice. I want to do this one day, but my boss doesn't like idea. So, <laughs> But how it's possible to do? So basically, it's possible to do with 
AWS Lambda. So basically how it works is that you tell Alexa, okay, Alexa, help me. Alexa, translate all your requests into intents. And after that, this intents sent to AWS Lambda. And AWS Lambda will send your response, also do some functionalities that you can put and send answer to you and you will hear, hear the answer. Now let's go to the demo. Before going to the demo, I want to show you a setup here, developer console, where you can de develop your Alexa. For this, you need to skills define invocation. In our case, it would be Python help. After that, you need to define different intents. For example, we have standard intents, and here we have intent for tech event and conferences. We want to hear when the next tech event and conference. Great. And also, we need to define our AWS Lambda. Here, I hope you see that, for example, one of the examples that we have our handler for conferences, where basically we use decorator, where we put the name of the intent. In here, we put simple functionality. OK, just remove, uh, return this like phrase and answer user. So let's go to the demo part. And let's pick, let's type uh, Python help to invoke our Alexa. Oh, we have some. Wait. Hi, hi, Munich and hi, ladies. I'm here to help Pythonists. Okay, okay, nice. Okay. And now let's type when is the next conference. Now I need to check my spelling. Next Python conference is on PyConda and Pi Data Berlin 2024 on from 22 April through 24th of April 2024. Great. And for example, usually it understands your speech as well, but for this demo, we just use typing because my laptop right now will it will be hard to recognize. And for example, we can just ask when is the next tech event. And you also will get your answer. Next Python meetup is Munich Data Geeks November edition on November 30th. Yeah, and with simple functionality, you can build a bot. That's all from my side. Bravissimo! Can you tune that script so that our meetups get a bit, you know? For sure. I, Next okay, time. Very good. Yeah, I mean, I data data so gigs you. are great. Highly recommended. <laughs> we are friends, but you know, a bit of your friendly gesture. <laughs> yes. okay. Good. Next time. Big thanks to Yulia. And next one is Vlad, the Python monster from London. For Tech 5, this Anton. Thank you. Um, Working as a cloud architect for Tech5. This is my second appearance on Pi Munich. I was here in August with another talk. So today I'm talking a bit more architecture and a bit more Python code. So once we have the slides, uh, I really liked it back in August. So I decided to come again and I'm looking for more events. This is great event, thanks to Anton. And I think we are, we said thank you to Jenya, to our uh, DJ, we said thanks to our speakers, but we didn't yet thank Anton as the organizer, please. Oh, oh, thank you so much. You are cooler than the yacht, I told you. Um, so I've been to some Python events, but I think this is the best. This is like the best energy, the best fun, and the best organization. Thank you. Um, OK, here we go. So I promised to talk a bit about architecture and we are talking about hexagonal architecture. So what it is, it's nice and it has six sides. Oh my God, why? Why do we need this? Like we have so many other patterns in architecture and approaches. So the idea here is that it's a good pattern that can help in some ways to organize when you have external dependencies and you have different inputs. So it allows you to split them and keep your core logic in a good place. So let me talk about each part. 
So the core of the application is its business logic. This is where you want to focus. And you don't want to mix this with database access or some API calls, et cetera. And this is how you do it. You separate ports and ports are these connectors where you need to connect to database. You need to send an email or text message, et cetera. Adapters are things that plug into ports and they do the job. So you can store data in database or message queue. It can be Postgres uh, or it can be MySQL. And you, you may need to have different adapters depending on what database you're using right now. So this is what this architecture allows you to do. Code. OK, we want to look, you know, how does this translate to your code? So the control is the main piece. This is where you implement your business logic. Here, it's very simple. If you say do create, then things are created. The email is sent, OK? Uh, then the actual job of doing the stuff is delegated to the port. The port is like your interface. You just, in the port, you declare, OK, I have functionality of creating email, uh, connecting to database, uh, storing something in the database, etc. So the port doesn't have any implementation. The implementation comes from an adapter. And this adapter uses, for example, um, SMTP email client to send. Another adapter can use uh, Amazon uh, messaging for emails, etc. So you can have as many adapters as there are different systems that you can use. They all implement the same interface, but with different clients, with different methods to do the job. And you can swap them depending on your need. Now, you change the adapters, but your logic stays the same, your controller is the same, and your port is the same. So those are the parts that don't change. The great thing about this architecture, it helps you test your code, it makes it easier. Let's see how it's done. So this is the control we saw before. This is the part that you really want to test because this is your business logic. How do you write the test? Okay, so we do the mock of our ports and you, you remember that ports is something that connects you to external systems. And now it's all really easy. So you abstract away all those external dependencies. And now you can focus on just the business logic that you have in your application, right? So you can say, oh, this is how my da data should look like. And I want to verify that whatever is coming back is what I expect so that my logic functions correctly. So remember, separate your business logic from lower level abstractions like uh, database connections, APIs, etc. Okay. Now, how do you approach the building the architecture? I, I mentioned this a couple times. The business logic is the most important part. So the core of your application. So you need to understand. And from my experience, it is hard. I often find myself writing a lot of logic in the adapter. The other day I thought like, oh my God, why my adapter is so complicated? How do I make sure that the business logic doesn't go there? And then the way to approach this is you try to think, if I replace this adapter for um, Microsoft SQL database with Postgres, do I need to copy this logic there? Oh yes, then it means it's a business logic really. It belongs in the control in the upper level because in the adapter you only write the part that's specific to this database or, or this API that you want to plug, right? Because it's the adapter. Now, we, we said that adapters are for different things. So I can have a message queue adapter, I can have a database adapter, uh, email adapter, SMS adapter, and so on. Um, the ports are just interfaces. So these are abstract things that you need from your adapter and what I like about this architecture, it forces you to do your unit testing right. So you can focus on, on the business logic and write the test for it. You don't need to test your database. Okay. So mentioned testability is the big one. Now you can easily swap parts. So if you think that your application will need to support different uh, backends in the future, this will help you swap and it helps you to structure in such a way that it's modular, so you don't mix everything together. 
So it's easy to separate the core business logic from you know those plumbing below. Okay, it's not easy as with design parts. This is big. This is like how you structure your whole application. So you kind of learn how to do it right. Uh, it requires some investment, and you need to be careful with your dependencies to to make it right. But if you are building something bigger, that it really pays off in the end. Um, so don't try to do too much. Do something small in the beginning and work with others because if you're building something complex, uh, you sometimes don't really know where to draw these boundaries. So the input from your team can help. Okay, that's everything I have. That's how I learned to, to do hexagon architectures and I do recommend them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any spontaneous speakers? Be brave. Come on, it's, it's a good time. No, okay, that's good. Then we come to the, con do we? Hmm? If, you can, if you can sing a song, that also qualifies as a, maybe Merry Christmas, some jingle bells, I don't know. No, not today, good. Then we come to the final time, and this is where we say thanks. And this is very important, because first, it's not just us, it's by Munich, Last by ladies, so I would like by ladies organizers here, Olga, you as well, please. And we need to say a special thanks to them, because to be honest, like there were times when I'm so lazy, but Lisa <laughs> is is really like pushing hard. And we have to do it. We have to do it. We do it, and we actually did it. So uh, yeah, big thank you to by ladies. This is number thank one. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's kind of cold outside, so I guess we wouldn't be meeting on the street. So NetLight is not only giving us the location and the possibility to do this, but also share their enthusiasm. Like they are actually very motivated to do this sort of event, so, as I feel. So I would invite Rafael as well here, please. And you are representative of NetLight, so. Okay. Please. So thanks for hosting us. Then, as you noticed, except of the stupid jokes, I don't talk much about Python, so. I would also invite all the speakers of today to come on the stage because this is the content. Please. <laughs> Julia, Alina, all of you. That's great. Okay. And then finally, yeah, there is also a missing piece. Like we are a meetup, but uh, we are also a company. We are an agency. And this is something that stays behind the scenes, but it shouldn't. So I would ask all of our team members who do this to also come to the stage. And that's Eugene, that's Daniela. Where are you, Daniela? Here, please. <laughs> and, Eugene, and Eugene is still tuning the camera. Like, he's so responsible. Like, Eugene, come, it doesn't matter anymore. It's okay, so please. Did we forget anybody from our team? No, we didn't, everybody here. Because it's a lot of overlap. Like, we are uh, a company, we are a community, we are speakers as well, organizers as well. So, uh, yeah, everybody paid their piece, and it's not even my ideas for the most part. Like, you saw these chocolate bars. Like, Daniela is three weeks with us, and that was fully her idea. By the way, I, I, I have to speak about those chocolates. They are, of course, promotional chocolates. And it's <laughs> talking about us, about our company, because we do this stuff uh, of meetups. It's our, like, free time. It's our passion. But we also work. We are Python developers. So we are very active in Munich. So if you have a project where you need help, Please remember the good ones, the ones who pay back to the community and hit us up. Apart from that, uh, I cannot invite really all of you to the stage because this is, yeah, even with the net light, it, I think it would maybe crash. <laughs> I really like eating a lot before Christmas, so maybe it's not just me. But yeah, again, we would not do it for the empty room, obviously. So it's always good, and we have this emotional connection to the audience, I think. So I would say then now a big thank you into that direction. Now we, applause to them. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay, now we have a challenge. We have something like 20 minutes to finish all the beer of NetLight. You think we can do that? Yeah? Okay, then let's take a challenge. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Beautiful.